Welcome to the White Collar Advice channel, everyone. I'm Justin Perper, and we're gonna jump right in. In a recent video, I mentioned my friend Benson Varghese, a wonderful lawyer who does not have a God complex, and I got several messages from people that were like, I'd love to learn more, and what makes Benson a great lawyer that you're happy to recommend. So we're not gonna get into fluff background, we're just gonna jump right in with some questions we've received from viewers, Benson. So welcome, are you ready? I'm ready, thank you for having me. Let's part now. These questions have come from people in our community. Number one, can Benson share a specific case where the def his defense strategy helped reduce a client's prison sentence? And what were some of the factors that contributed to that success? Absolutely, two come to mind right away. And the first, I'll answer the question directly and talk about someone with a much lower prison sentence. I had a um, lady who uh, was in her 50s get charged with a drug offense. Interestingly, she had actually turned her life around and had a couple of years of sobriety, but the offense conduct was still within the statute of limitations. The feds had a righteous case that they could present and that's what they did is they filed charges against her for a pretty high level offense. And we sat down and we talked and she had a very compelling story of how she self-corrected, which is remarkable. She had years of a better track record. And we said, well, what can we do to change the dynamic here? And because of early intervention and because of her own ability to self-correct, we got in with the prosecutors proper and ended up with a cell phone charge, which basically means you used a cell phone in the commission of a drug offense, reduced her sentence by 20 fold. So she still had to serve some time, but it was a fraction of what she was looking at. And for those of you who may not be familiar with the term proffer, it just means you're going to give the government some information that's valuable to them. So she had to be contrite. She had to say, hey, yes, I messed up, but we were able to leverage the thing that she'd done. The other case that comes to mind cheats the question a little bit because the uh, outcome was even better than a reduced sentence. Because of early intervention, I had a young guy come to me with a white collar offense and the feds were prepared to charge him. But because he reached out to me so early before a case had been filed, and essentially as soon as he knew agents were involved, I was able to reach out to the agent, talk about this young man who was actually in nursing school. Yes, he had committed a criminal offense that they could charge him for. But I said, look, what can we do to make this right? We got on a plan to pay restitution and got a non-prosecution agreement, which means he wasn't prosecuted at all as long as he lived by some conditions and paid the restitution that he promised to pay, which he did. And so because of early intervention, we avoided prosecution altogether. And that, of course, is a grand slam. Before I go to the next question, I want to chime in. What you said is so relevant because it speaks to the lawyer advocating, but also a defendant doing the work and memorializing and showing growth and progress. There's a lot of people who might Google the phrase, I received a target letter. They may, may reach out to us. And the, the shame is they still think it's too early to begin preparing. It's like, you got a target letter. The feds are building a case. They might have issued a DOJ press release. Your banks are firing you. You're in crisis. Do you really think it's too early to prepare? So just confirm the second you are a target, you begin preparing. Absolutely. The second you're a target, you get that target letter. You know what investigation is going on. You need to reach out to an attorney. None of the conversations or outcomes that we were able to achieve would have been possible if the person either just sat there and waited or tried to engage with the feds themselves. I mean, so many things that you're able to achieve only can be achieved through an attorney. So as soon as you know, reach out. I'm going to rephrase one of the questions that came in, and I'm going to touch on this in a separate video. When some people reach out to our team or they speak with me, there's a level of comfort because I'm so open about what I did. I facilitated a fraud. I went to prison. I did bad things. I will frequently say to someone, whatever you're going to tell me, it's not worse than what I did. So there's an understanding. That said, some defendants are afraid to speak openly to their lawyer. You're in a position of power, you're educated, you meet with judges and prosecutors, you went to law school, you're law abiding, <laughs> at least is the way the government would see it. Some clients are like, I'm afraid to tell my lawyer everything. Talk about the importance of speaking openly with your lawyer and you really can't help someone unless you know everything. So I take that on as part of my job to make them feel comfortable enough to talk to me and share things. And I'm very open about 
the type of firm this is, the type of lawyer that I am, I want a relationship with you. And that relationship is built on trust. I'm not a volume practitioner. I don't want to be a volume practitioner. I want to know you, everything that you've been through, because ultimately to be the best advocate, I have to know you. So it doesn't do you any justice to tell me half of the story. Story. Tell me everything. Help me help you so that I am prepared for anything that could come our way, whether the government knows about it or not. Because based on what you tell me, I can craft a pathway forward that will get us to the best place we can be. You know, on the front end, I can't assure you that it will be a non-prosecution, those are rare, even a low-end sentence. But what I can promise you is if you work with me and we're both doing the work that's required, we will get to the best outcome that is achievable. Think about that, what we're saying. I filmed a video, a live video yesterday about when I hired a lawyer, I lied to my lawyers and the government. I flew money, flush money down the toilet. I got a longer sentence. Once I resigned myself to going all in, that's when my life changed. So if you're concerned, you have attorney client, if you're concerned about saying something, you say it. That's the only way your, your lawyer, someone like Benson, is able to advocate for you. But what I don't want is for you to get a plea agreement you don't agree with, get a sentence you don't agree with, and say the facts aren't there, the facts aren't there. And then so much of the time, Benson will learn what those facts haven't been articulated properly to your lawyer. They need to know every single nuance. Let's continue with some questions here. People are asking about what are some common misconceptions that defendants might have about the sentencing process and how can you address some of those misperceptions? A common problem that my clients face, they've either never been in trouble before or the only aspect of the criminal justice system they've seen or heard about is the state system. And in Texas, you have jury punishment, you have prosecutors making very specific plea offers on what the outcome is potentially gonna be. The federal system for most people is so different. And I'll sometimes use the phrase, it almost seems un-American how the federal justice system works. So misconceptions about, well, what's actually gonna move the needle? What can I do to change things? Can I change things at all? Is this a lost cause? How much time do I have left? Because what's key to what you and I both tell people is Words, everyone has words, right? If you go sit in court any given morning, you hear a lot of people apologizing for what they've done and asking for mercy. But very few people have the actions to back it up. And if you only have three or four months, then make the most of those three or four months before you get to sentencing. There's so much that can be done. And if you do it, and if you use your time wisely, you will be very different than everyone else who's being sentenced that day. And you'll make a very different impression on the judge. So the, the misconceptions are, um, I can't do anything about the situation I'm in. I've, I've already messed up and I'm going to federal prison for a long time. Um, as punitive as a system as it can be, there's still a lot that can be done. And so being able to find hope in that moment and getting good direction in that moment is just critical. Uh, thank you. I agree. And also sometimes people have this misperception that because it's their first offense, or they didn't have bad intentions, or perhaps because they're cooperating or even paid back some money that that is like a golden ticket to probation or, or a shorter sentence. And they buy into this belief that, hey, the guidelines are there. They apply to other people. They're not going to be applicable to me. And if they think they're magically going to get a shorter sentence, they might not do the, the necessary work. Years ago, and I spoke with a judge, Judge Pearson in Ohio, and she said something like, if you think you are if you want probation, act like you're going to get a life sentence. And the point was that you do the work. There are people who think they're going to get probation, then they don't do the work and they don't get the outcome they want. And we reverse engineer their choices. And it's like, of course you didn't get probation, dude. You made terrible choices. You didn't mitigate. You didn't do anything to show why you're worthy of leniency. Let's continue. I have been critical at times. You've been very supportive of our work. And for transparency, I've worked with Benson for many years. We've referred clients to one another. I've spoken at a legal conference he oversaw in Fort Worth. But I have been critical of lawyers at times feel the defendants can feel a little bit exploited or forgotten, scared, don't know how to hire a lawyer. And people like knowing how well we work and we do this with lawyers across the country. Why offer some advice on how someone can work well with a, a mitigation team like us and the lawyer and the respective roles? Absolutely. So, you know, Justin, you are unique and your group is unique in that. 
other than my own resources, articles I've written, my YouTube channel, you are literally the only other resource I send people to. And that's not just clients that I've referred to you. Your YouTube channel or books that I've given out that you've written are literally the only other resource that I've trusted to give people. And what I do as an attorney, helping them understand the offense conduct, what the prosecutor's thinking, I'm in a particularly tough jurisdiction, what the judges are going to do, how the prosecutors feel about certain things, how you navigate the whole system is part of the equation. But the other part of the equation is really what is the client feeling? And you and your team are so well equipped to help them with the getting to the right mindset. Uh, you know, when you touch on, hey, people don't understand sometimes the severity of the potential sentence that's coming um, or that they're facing, it's a mindset issue, right? And if you don't understand the gravity of the situation, you're not going to put in the work. You're you're not going to make the life changes that you have to change. When, when people come to me, I'm looking at it as not just a legal situation I want to get them through, but this is a moment, wherever you are in life, to change your life. It's not just, hey, I've got to live by, if I'm on release, the conditions of supervised release, I'm going to go above and beyond. And what I have found that your team has helped with so much is getting folks in the right mindset of, if there's restitution to be made, how do I make that and why am I making that? If, I'm, if I've got two or three or four months left and I can only work at McDonald's because no one else will hire me, why would I do that? What am I showing the judge by putting forth the effort? You are so good at helping people get in that mindset because as you said, you've gone down this road and you've seen what works and what doesn't work and you, you spend your entire life talking to people including judges who are giving you feedback on, hey, here are the things that resonate with me. And those are the things that my clients need to know. And from my perspective, uh, hearing it from another person with a unique background certainly helps. But, uh, you know, when people ask me, hey, uh, would you consider working with a prison consultant? I always say only if it's you well, or your team. Uh, because there are a lot of people out there that say they – do the things that you do. Uh, candidly, I don't trust anyone else. I appreciate you saying that. Thank you. I, I want to talk about what I call good cop, bad cop at times with the defendant and the lawyer. So our team will help create some sentencing narratives that can go to a probation officer, go to the judge, go to, go to every stakeholder. Someday your probation officer, whom you'll need after prison, should read that narrative and it should be updated. But every now and again, we may get a, have a conversation with a client that's like, Where's all the great stuff that I do, you know, and, and we got to parse out some of the conduct here. And what about all the volunteer work and stuff that I and my response is and I want you to concur or disagree with me. Your message we tell is deference, humility, accept responsibility. If you identify with victims, how? What is your plan to make them whole? Let the lawyer sell all the great things that you do, all those factors that demonstrate why you're worthy of a, a shorter sentence. Would, would you can you touch on that a bit? Absolutely. And. Going back to the fact that there's two parts, as an attorney, one of my jobs is to understand who our audience is, and there are multiple audiences, but for sentencing specifically, who's the judge that we're in front of? Because the judges that I practice in front of, I get to know, I, I learn what resonates with them, and I'm going to frame everything that my client has done in a way that I know resonates with the judge. So if I know something's not going to resonate with the judge, I may mention it, but I'm not going to put too much emphasis on it. Um, so doing the work is important. Getting in the right mindset is important. But then being able to trust your attorney to say, hey, these are the things that I know are going to work. And yes, I'm including some other things in there for all the secondary audiences that will be using something like the presents report. We can spend hours discussing all these subjects, but I know questions have come in. I want to kind of go through some quick fire with you. You mentioned a proffer. Someone's like, I've heard of a reverse proffer. What's that? So I have a uh, former colleague who's now a judge, and I'm going to use his phrase to describe a reverse proffer. He called it showing the bra strap. And basically, it is the government telling you this is our case. They may not tell you everything about their case. But they're going to show you enough that you know 
hey, they've really got something on you. And depending on who you're working with, the Asian may, USA is involved, they might tell you a lot about what they know. At a minimum, they're going to tell you enough that you walk away knowing they can definitely make their case. And there's a reason for this. They're not doing this out of the graciousness uh, of their heart. They understand that if there's some transparency there, at least in some regard, there's a greater likelihood that you will enter a plea, and perhaps rightly so. They're doing this because the cost and work that goes into preparing for a trial far exceed them showing a little bit of what their case is. Um, and they too are trying to get you in the mindset that they deem is appropriate, which is, hey, they've got a provable case against you. Let's talk about 5K1 and cooperation credit ranges you've seen. In, in your district, for example, is it 28 points? Based on the cooperation, we're going to take it to 20 points. Is it a percentage reduction? Help us understand that. That's a common question I get in my district, which is very conservative. It's very hard to put a number on it. I have seen some pretty dramatic decreases, but I never go into a cooperation agreement um, with a specific expectation. I know what I'm asking the prosecutor and behind the scenes what um, – I'm asking them to perhaps avoid arguing or argue, and I know what I'm asking the judge, and sometimes you'll get even agents that you have impressed so much that they'll go in and do an in-camera conversation with the judge, telling the judge how much you've impressed them. But in my district, it's very hard to put a number on it. I've seen um, minimal reductions, and I've seen some pretty dramatic ones. Um, there's so many aspects to what you're trying to achieve when you go into – uh, I know you said rapid fire. When you go into cooperate, you want to work on both the prosecutor and ultimately the judge. Couple, I want to spend a few more minutes and then we'll wrap up uh, this video and I hope we can do more. Can you touch on, I mean, this is what happens. People plead guilty. They have no idea how much money they may owe. They've never heard of restitution or forfeiture. Many defendants are kind of just, I just want to get the shortest prison sentence. They don't understand the collateral consequences, what that means. So I'll go to restitution and forfeiture in a moment. Someone signed a plea. They're like, hey, what are 3553 factors I read about on your website? What are these guidelines? Does that apply to me? And it's like you're a federal defendant that hired a lawyer, signed a plea agreement. You don't know what this is. That's a problem. Can you touch on some of these 3553 factors? Absolutely. So the 3553 factors essentially can be boiled down as all the reasons that the sentencing guidelines say the judge could give you a lower sentence. So they're a list of prescribed things that you can talk about. What I often ask my clients to think about are disadvantages growing up, and I want them to think broadly. It's not just about abuse or lack of resources, anything that puts them at a disadvantage. I wanna be able to talk about their personal characteristics, their uh, not only drug use, if there was any, but how they got introduced to it. We wanna be able to tell the story of, yes, I made a mistake, but here's why. And so through those 3553 factors, you are able to give the judge a narrative and your attorney should use it to craft a story about you. You want that to be a compelling, um, not just list of factors, but really a story about you, how you got there and how you're making amends. Um, I usually use it, use it in conjunction with some sort of other sentencing memorandum or something that further tells the story. Let's talk about restitution and forfeiture for a moment. Just like some people sign a plea and don't know the guidelines or points, some are unaware that there could be restitution, forfeiture, or both. My question is, should you know when you sign a plea agreement what the number is, or could that get resolved all the way through sentencing? It can get resolved through sentencing, but on the front end, you want to have those conversations as the attorney with the prosecution. So, for example, I'm talking to a prosecutor this week, and they're going to include uh, language that specifies what is subject to forfeiture, and we're ironing that out as part of the agreement. Uh, in other cases, for example, where we were contesting guilt and went to trial, didn't get the verdict we wanted, well then, of course, you're going to get additional materials about what the government wants in restitution and what's subject to forfeiture later on down the road. But as most cases are resolved through plea negotiations, that should be part of the conversation with the prosecutor rather than getting surprised later. Too many of you get surprised. We want you to ask these questions of your lawyer right now. Like right now, we don't want to delay. I want to wrap up the video. Benson's in Texas, terrific lawyer in Texas. Of course, if you're looking for a lawyer, hire him. If you have questions about lawyers across the country, you might need a referral. 
in the YouTube description. I will put up an email to Benson's law firm. You could reach out. He has a network across the country. I want to close with advice you would have to someone, a doctor, a lawyer, a PPP case. I just got a target letter. I'm indicted. I'm scared. I have to hire a lawyer. I've never done it before. I go to Google. I type in buzzwords. Marketing websites come up. I don't know if they can really help me. What are a few questions you would suggest someone ask a lawyer they're considering hiring? I would ask if that attorney has handled this type of a case in this jurisdiction. So using a doctor as an example, I just talked to a doctor charged with um, essentially running a pill mill is the accusation. And I was able to talk to that doctor about a similar case that I had handled in this jurisdiction. Talk about the prosecutors, the agents, how they approach these cases, what judges do. You might sometimes be tempted to click on the first, you know, ad on Google, and it looks like someone uh, practices nationwide or this great attorney in New York, but I'm in Texas. Hey, he can help me out. He says he can help me out. I would drill down a little bit more to see what that person's experience is with this type of case and ideally in the jurisdiction where you're facing the charges and try to see if, if they have the time to talk to you at a personal level. You know, if they're picking up the phone and are done in 10 minutes, that may not be the person for you. Whether someone hires me or, or not, generally my first consultation is an hour plus on a federal case because it takes that much time to understand even the beginnings of the dynamics that are going on. Let, let's thank you. Let, let's One thing I like about your firm, you seem to manage communications really well. When someone hires you, they know who on your team with whom you would be speaking. Sometimes people might hire a lawyer, the main guy, and they don't talk to the main guy all that much. Others are doing the work. Talk about perhaps managing communications when hiring a lawyer so that expectations are managed. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's a great question to ask during the hiring process. Um, there are firms where they've got a great attorney who is their closer, who takes the consults or is on the phone. It's a fair question. Hey, will I be working with you or someone else on your team? You need to know the answer to that question because that that's the relationship you're forming. You want to talk to the right person um, and have the question specific to the attorney that will actually be handling the case. In regards to communication, we pride ourselves on communication both over the phone, through our client portal. Um, we're constantly sending our clients articles that I've written or YouTube videos that I put together. Communication should never be a problem with your attorney. You have brought them the biggest problem in your life you need to have access to them. So if that's a problem, that's a red flag, and you should maybe decide to change course before it's too late. One more question. I'll put up a link to a video I filmed called 12 Questions to Ask a Lawyer. I assure you, if you asked Benson, he would answer them, no problem. Last thing, some people, believe it or not, Benson, will get a sentencing memorandum and it's already been turned in. Or they'll say, hey, they'll say, this is due in 10 minutes. Let me know your thoughts. It's like, what's the point? Can you just touch on what exactly is the sentencing memorandum and should a defendant be vested in that? Like how far in advance of this thing getting turned into the court should the client be getting vested in that? Absolutely. So the sentencing memorandum is one of the most powerful tools that you have to present your case to a federal judge. And federal judges are uh, impacted far more by written filings than they are with the oral presentations that are made on the date of sentencing. And you need to know that your attorney should be talking to you about what your sentencing memorandum is going to look like. Essentially, as soon as you know, this is going to be a plea agreement. Okay. So the, the months leading up to sentencing are require you to sit down with your attorney, have meaningful conversations so that your attorney knows everything and that you are seeing drafts of what the attorney intends on submitting to the judge. It's not uncommon for me to send a first draft to a client and say, I'm, look, I'm still working on this, but I want you to know this is the meat of what I'm, I intend on turning into the judge. Because if you had that question of, well, why didn't you include more about my volunteer work? The attorney's either gonna say, you know what, that's a great point, or gonna tell you, hey, with this judge, I'm only gonna include two sentences about it because mm -hmm. these are the other things. You need to know what's gonna be in that and Look, everyone has deadlines, I understand, but if you're involved in the process and you're talking to your attorney, there's no reason your attorney is going to give that to you the day of uh, filing, the day he's turning it in. 
Bonus question, I'd be remiss to not mention the value of the probation report because at a lot of sentencing hearings, the judge will open up and ask the defendant, have you read it? Yes. Do you understand it? Yes. Did you go through it with your lawyer? So many defendants believe this is a 10 or 15 minute interview, not a big deal. Of course, it has lasting implications. Close by stressing the value of the pre-sentence report at a sentencing hearing. The pre-sentence report is one of the most important documents the judge is going to look at and other people, including the BOP, are eventually going to look at. I'm going to tell you the way we work, and I would recommend that you do this with um, your attorney. So very early on, essentially, as soon as we've done the plea, I am sending my client the questions that probation is going to ask because they always ask the same questions. They literally have the form, and the jurisdictions do them a little bit differently. They're basically the same questions your attorney can get them from probation. So I send those questions to my client and I say, don't fill this out. I want you to think about it. And then I want you to meet with me and I wanna go over these questions together one time. I'm gonna give you feedback. And then I want you to go home and think about it more. And then we're gonna compile the answers. I'm gonna re review them and I'm gonna give them to probation before we get to the pre-sentence report interview. That way, even if the interviewer does not ask all the right questions or give you all the time, we have something that is memorialized. And I've used that to our advantage when, you know, probation officers um, try to do a good job, but sometimes don't include everything we want them to. And I'm able to say, and by the way, we submitted this to your probation judge, and I just want you to know it. We pull out excerpts. Please take the time to do that. I know too many folks that end up going to their interviews with no one having prepared them for what's coming. So be involved in your process. This is your life. It's your future. Um, and squeaky wheel gets the, gets the wheel, the attention, uh, the grease, the attention. So be involved in your process. I'm going to put up a link to, I'll, I'll grant you access to those watching for like next to nothing, a dollar, uh, a probation report course that we created. That I, It's about three hours and it covers a lot of what Benson suggested. Questions they could ask you, how to respond if they don't ask you something, how to get it on the record things of that nature. It's a two and a half or three hours worth of video that I lead. And like Benson, you have to be your best advocate, work and do that in conjunction with, with your team. Benson, I'm super grateful that you've taken so much time to speak with us. I hope you'll return. And I'm just very grateful to work with you and to continue to learn from you. Same. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Wonderful. Thank you.